Ever since I began studying at the National Art School in Sydney, way back in the 1950s, I was intrigued by the many and often substantial changes in artistic styles which have occurred in Europe over the centuries. From the early Greco-Roman art, as revealed by the frescoes rescued from Pompeii, to the Byzantine art of the Middle Ages, to the Florentine Renaissance, and all the way to the 20th century. I wondered what could have been the major drivers of these remarkable changes. Over time I began to realize that there was one particular idea which seemed to have had a huge impact on the history of Western art. That idea was iconoclasm. Iconoclasm is a social belief in the importance of the destruction of icons or images or monuments, most frequently for religious or political reasons. Iconoclasts are people who support or engage in the destruction of icons or images. And iconophiles are people who revere and worship religious images and who oppose their destruction. To understand the rise of iconoclasm, we must first appreciate that for several millennia, in Europe and elsewhere, pagan religions recognized and worshipped a multitude of gods and goddesses. Then, about 1300 years before the birth of Christ, Egypt had a pharaoh called Amenhotep IV. This pharaoh appears to have been the first to declare that there was only one god, in his case, Aten, the sun god. He changed his name to Akhenaten. Thus was born the idea of monotheism. When he died, the priestly establishment of ancient Egypt swiftly reversed his religious policies and reintroduced the old worship of many gods and goddesses. The high priests of Egypt did a great job of trying to obliterate the memory of Akhenaten, and he was lost to history until the late 19th century. The next major figure to feature in the story of monotheism was the prophet Moses, who, according to the rabbinical texts, led the people of Israel out of bondage in e Egypt and guided them to the Holy Land. After speaking with his God on Mount Sinai, Moses returned with two stone tablets upon which were carved the Ten Commandments. The first commandment states categorically that I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thus monotheism is reborn. The second commandment in the Judaic tradition states that thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. It is this second commandment in the old Judaic version which has had a huge impact on the course of European art history over the centuries. The birth and death of Jesus Christ heralded a new religion, Christianity. At first, the early Christians were a tiny, persecuted Jewish sect which existed precariously in a small part of the mighty Roman Empire. This is a map indicating the extent of the mighty Roman Empire at that time. Thanks to apostles like St. Paul, a decision was made to spread the word of Christianity way beyond the confines of Judea, both westwards towards ancient Greece and Rome, and eastward to far-off places like Armenia. The apostles soon learnt that if they wished to convert the pagans to Christianity, they could not afford to alienate them by pouring scorn on their ancient traditional beliefs and customs. The early Christian church quickly took over some old pagan beliefs and transformed them into Christian rituals and festivals. Have you ever wondered why the Christian festival of Easter, which tells us the story of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, is often associated 
with Easter eggs and bunny rabbits. That is because Easter was actually an ancient pagan festival celebrating the Mesopotamian goddess of fertility. Easter, spelt with an H but pronounced Easter, was a goddess whose cult was brought first to the island of Cyprus, where the Greeks adopted her and named her Aphrodite. Later, the Romans also adopted her and named her Venus. The early Christians also understood that the pagans of Greece and Rome loved looking at their beautiful frescoes and mosaics, which featured images of all kinds of creatures. In addition to that, given that the population at that time was largely illiterate, the early Christians appreciated the value of images or icons to help spread the teachings of Jesus. In the early decades of the 4th century, the Roman Emperor Constantine the Great ended the persecution of Christians and later caused Christianity to become the official religion of the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire in the 4th century AD was in turmoil. At one stage there were no less than four co-emperors ruling over a divided empire until Constantine I finally defeated all his rivals. Constantine chose a small fishing village on the eastern edge of the Roman Empire called Byzantium as his new capital. He renamed it Constantinople. Over the centuries Constantinople became the center of the rich and powerful Byzantine Empire. By the time of the Emperor Justinian I in the 6th century AD, the wealthy and powerful Christian bishops of Constantinople had achieved a remarkable compromise between those who loved and venerated images or icons and those who wanted to prohibit the worship of graven images in accordance with God's second commandment. That compromise resulted in the unique Byzantine style of art. The old pagan art was based upon a close study of the natural world which was perceived in three dimensions. The new Byzantine art featured a much more two-dimensional view not of the earth but of the heavenly arena. The key to this momentous change lay in the study of perspective. There are basically three kinds of perspective, overlapping, aerial or atmospheric perspective and scientific perspective. In this diagram, the two figures on the left are standing side by side and appear to be on the same plane. On the right, figure B is overlapped by figure A and thus appears to be a bit behind him. This is the simplest device to suggest the idea of depth. Aerial or atmospheric perspective uses differences in color and tone to evoke a sense of depth. In this diagram, all the floating objects are identical in size, and yet some appear to be up front, while others seem to fade away into the background. Scientific perspective can be viewed as a highly complicated game of geometry. In this simple diagram about single point perspective, we see that all the parallel lines of the buildings appear to converge upon a single vanishing point on the distant horizon line. Here we have an example of two point perspective with two vanishing points on the horizon line. At the core of scientific perspective there is a simple proposition. As objects move away from us they will appear to get smaller and smaller. In reality they remain the same size but we perceive them as becoming smaller as they move away. Artists may also use a device called chiaroscuro to suggest the existence of solid three-dimensional forms in space. In Italian chiaroscuro means light and dark. In this delightful painting 
we can see how Claude Lorraine has used these devices to create a three-dimensional universe on a flat two-dimensional surface. Indeed, by painting a setting sun, clever Claude has hinted at a fourth dimension, that of time. In order to arrive at an acceptable compromise between the iconoclasts and the iconophiles within their empire, the Byzantine bishops created a unique style of art which focused attention on a flat two-dimensional vision of the heavenly arena. This new Byzantine art was carefully regulated. All artists employed by the church had to adhere to strict guidelines. In contrast to the pagan backgrounds of distant misty blue skies, Byzantine art insisted upon bright golden backgrounds which would emphasize flatness. Instead of the size of figures indicating their position in three-dimensional space, Byzantine art insisted that size would indicate the spiritual importance of the figures involved. In this example, we see that the Virgin Mary is the largest figure. The two saints are a little smaller, while the two worshippers at her feet are tiny. There were significant events happening in Europe in the 5th and 6th centuries AD. While the Eastern Byzantine Empire remained relatively prosperous and strong, the Western Roman Empire was completely destroyed by the year 476 AD. Indeed, in 410 AD, the Visigoths, led by the king Alaric, had conquered and sacked Rome itself. Indeed, the Byzantine Emperor Justinian I then had to lead his army to reconquer those territories which we now call Italy. Although the Western Roman Empire had ceased to exist, the Christian Church was somehow able to convert to Christianity most of the pagan invaders. This photo is an example of a Visigothic Christian crypt built in the 7th century AD in Spain and it is now beneath the cathedral in Palencia. These historical events created a deep division between Western and Eastern Europe, which had profound consequences in the centuries ahead. The 7th century witnessed the birth of Islam. Right from the beginning, Muslim armies posed a huge threat to the Byzantine Empire although it was not until 1453 AD that Constantinople was finally conquered by Muslim forces. Right from the start, the Muslims have faithfully obeyed God's second commandment. You will not find pictorial images of humans or animals in Islamic mosques. Instead, Muslim artists and artisans have created beautiful decorations using elaborate abstract designs, as well as text taken from the Quran. In the early part of the 8th century AD, the Byzantine army suffered humiliating defeats in battles with Muslim forces. Perhaps believing that this, these defeats were a sign of God's displeasure at the veneration of icons within the Byzantine Empire, Emperor Leo IV instituted the first iconoclasm in 726 AD. It lasted for 61 years. During that time, those who still venerated icons and images were persecuted and many had to flee from the Byzantine Empire to seek refuge elsewhere. Images of people and animals were destroyed and replaced by symbols such as a cross. The first iconoclastic period was ended by the iconophile Empress Irene, who is still commemorated as a saint on the 7th of August each year by the Byzantine Catholic and the Eastern Orthodox churches. It is interesting to note that when the Byzantines were enduring their two periods of intense iconoclasm, the Christian church in the west of Europe remained staunchly opposed to iconoclasm. 
all the popes at that time made it clear that the Western Christian Church would continue to venerate their icons. This was just one more indication of a growing schism between the Byzantine Empire and Western Europe. This schism was also due to the increasing rivalry in commerce and trade between Constantinople and some emerging maritime powers like Venice and Genoa in the west of Europe. At the beginning of the 13th century, Pope Innocent III called for a fourth crusade to recapture the Muslim-controlled city of Jerusalem. The intention was to first conquer the Ayyubid Sultanate in Egypt and then move north to attack Jerusalem. However, things did not go according to the original plan and because of a complicated series of events, the Fourth Crusade ended up attacking the Christian city of Constantinople, the very heart of the Byzantine Empire. The sack of Constantinople had dire consequences for the future of the Byzantine Empire. The city of Venice, which had largely funded the Fourth Crusade, was rewarded with some wartime loot. These four horses on the facade of St. Mark's Cathedral in Venice are replicants. The original horses are housed safely in the museum in Venice. The four bronze horses had been stolen from the Hippodrome in Constantinople. This Christian attack on Christian Constantinople weakened its military power and in 1453 an Ottoman army led by Sultan Mehmed II finally breached its massive walls and conquered the city. Constantinople is now known as Istanbul. While the Eastern Byzantine Empire was slowly declining towards oblivion, Western Europe, by contrast, was becoming stronger and more prosperous, and it was undergoing profound social changes. In the 11th century, the Normans succeeded in capturing Sicily from the Muslims who had controlled that island during the previous century. In Spain, by the 13th century AD, Christian armies had succeeded in capturing important cities like Cordoba and Seville from the Muslims, with only Granada remaining as an Islamic tributary state in the south. By 1492, the entire Spanish peninsula was controlled by Christian rulers. In this map, we can see the dates of successive victories by Christian forces against Islamic strongholds in Spain. In the 13th and 14th centuries in Western Europe, many artists were still painting in the old Byzantine style, which nowadays is usually called medieval art. This lovely painting by Duccio was created between 1308 and 1311 AD. It is part of a large altarpiece, which is now housed in the Cathedral Museum in Siena. But in the 13th century in Italy, another form of art was beginning to emerge. 200 years before the birth of Michelangelo, there was a radical artist called Giotto. In this painting from the Scriveni Chapel in Padua, we can see that Giotto had rediscovered chiaroscuro. His figures are round and solid. They are not flat. The painting by Giotto on the left shows buildings rendered in three dimensions, relying upon an understanding of scientific perspective. The photograph on the right shows a tall tower or campanile next to the cathedral in Florence. This tower was designed by Giotto, who had also been appointed as the official architect of Florence. Giotto was a new breed of artist. He was wealthy and successful at a time when a new class of merchants, artisans, entrepreneurs were becoming increasingly wealthy and politically powerful. This Giotto-esque period in us is sometimes called the Proto-Renaissance. 
Of all the merchants, bankers and entrepreneurs who flourished in this period, one family stood out in terms of its wealth and political power, as well as its amazing contribution to the history of Western art. They were the Medici of Florence. The House of Medici was an Italian banking family in the Republic of Florence, who became so powerful that over the years they had no less than four of their sons appointed as popes. They eventually became the Dukes of Florence. They were important patrons of the arts, who nurtured and promoted some of the greatest artists of their times, such as Michelangelo, Botticelli and Raphael. The institutions they created enabled the rise of the European Renaissance. The artistic ideals of the Florentine Renaissance soon spread across the rest of Europe. In the Netherlands, artists like the brothers Hubert and Jan van Eyck quickly adopted the new ideas and developed their own style of Northern European painting. The Medici also founded the Neoplatonic Academy, which tried to reconcile the new Renaissance style of art with the old medieval style. Apparently Michelangelo had absorbed some of their ideas. If we study closely this magnificent painting of the Last Judgment by Michelangelo in the Sistine Chapel, we will see that the figures are painted as solid three-dimensional forms in space, but the overall composition is a remarkable homage to the old Byzantine style. Here Jesus is depicted as one of the biggest and most prominent figures in the painting while the unfortunate sinners, being cast into hell in the bottom right corner, are tiny. I have mentioned earlier that the Medici family were able to have no less than four of its sons appointed as popes. Pope Leo X was appointed a cardinal of church at the tender age of 13. He later became the pope, although he had never served as a priest. During his time as a pope, the church was busy rebuilding St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome on a truly grand scale. It was a hugely expensive undertaking and the church struggled to finance this project. As a true son of the Medici, Pope Leo X used the sale of indulgences to raise the necessary funds to complete the rebuilding of St. Peter's. Indulgences can be described as passports to heaven. Christian sinners, who were destined normally to go to hell for their transgressions, could pay large sums of money and purchase their one-way tickets to heaven from the church. The sale of indulgences to rebuild St. Peter's may have seemed like a good idea at the time, but it provoked a massive reaction against the corrupt practices of the church at that time. In 1517 AD, an Augustinian monk called Martin Luther denounced the many forms of corruption within the church and helped to start the Protestant Reformation. And here we should pause to reflect upon a church mystery. Sometime in the past, the Catholic Church had somehow eliminated the original Second Commandment from its teaching. In the Protestant version of the Ten Commandments, we see that the Second Commandment once again states that Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. In the Catholic version, the Second Commandment says Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. This appears as a Third Commandment in the Protestant version. The effects of the Protestant iconoclasm can be seen in the appearance of some Protestant churches. This is a sparsely adorned Lutheran church, but which still has some stained glass windows containing images. The Calvinists were more extreme in their rejection of icons in their churches. Here we can see that their churches were stripped bare of all images. The Catholic Church responded to the attacks by the Protestant reformers by organizing a counter-reformation. 
between 1545 and 1563, the Council of Trent began the long process of ridding the Catholic Church of the most serious aspects of corruption. Never again would a wealthy family be able to simply buy their teenage sons a cardinalship. All future popes would have had to be priests before working their way up through the holy ranks of the Church. Seminaries were founded for the proper training of priests in the spiritual life of the Church. What was of great significance for the future of European art was that, in spite of the Protestant attacks on their religious credibility, the Catholic Church remained deeply opposed to iconoclasm. Instead of prohibiting images and icons in their churches, the Catholics vigorously promoted a brand new style of art, the Baroque. The flamboyant Baroque style of art was used by the Catholic Church as a cultural weapon against the austerity of Protestant art. The Baroque style soon conquered Western European art. Artists like Rembrandt and Rubens adopted the style with gusto and the style dominated the art scene in Europe for more than a century. The Reformation and the Counter-Reformation led to a series of bloody religious wars in Europe which lasted for more than a hundred years. In the area we now recognize as Germany, it has been estimated that up to 40% of the population perished in these conflicts. The horrors of these prolonged religious wars eventually led the educated elites of Europe to rebel against such conflicts which were based upon obscure doctrinal differences between the competing religions. Thus, in the 17th century, a movement emerged which came to be known as the Enlightenment or the Age of Reason. The Enlightenment was marked by an emphasis on the scientific method and a questioning of religious authority. It gave rise to a new style of art and architecture, that of neoclassicism, a revival of the styles of ancient Greece and Rome. As the conflicts between the Christian sects subsided in Europe, the word iconoclasm began to acquire a new and broader meaning. An iconoclast was soon understood to be someone who challenged any orthodoxy, secular or religious. These new types of iconoclasts dismissed neoclassical art as founded upon a bunch of tired old tricks of the trade. They were keen to invent new forms of art and architecture. From the 19th century onwards, we have witnessed an amazing array of new modern styles of art and architecture. In recent times, we have seen a more selective approach to iconoclasm or the destruction of images. Protesters have been destroying or defacing images and statues of public figures who are despised for their political reasons. In the 20th century, artists began to use new technologies to create their artworks. Today, movies and TV series are the most popular forms of visual art. In the past, artists were almost obliged to depend financially upon the rich and powerful, whether they were kings, popes or mere aristocrats. The artists who make movies now are dependent upon the sale of cinema tickets or streaming TV receipts. We now have a mass market for art. And the masses have spoken. We are all iconophiles today.